from now in chapter 12. Chapter 12 is a very, very short chapter relative to 11. Uh, 11 is loaded with material, 12 is much shorter, so we'll be able to get through this um, you know, by the end of Thursday, probably, if not sooner, and then get into 13, which is all the last chapter. So when we look at this, we are going to focus on a couple things, and in this chapter right now, in this module, we're going to be focusing on impairments, the U.S. gap, and the impairment of goodwill. Now, we're also going to go back and look at IFRS and compare the two. But if you remember from last week, when we did IFRS impairments, we said it's very simple. Because for IFRS, actually, every asset, planned assets, indefinite life intangibles, finite life intangibles, and even goodwill follow the same pattern. You compare the carrying value to something called a recoverable amount. And the recoverable amount is the higher of either the asset value in use or the value in exchange. And we'll do that again. U.S. GAAP, however, uh, <coughs> keeping in line with what I've been saying all along, is much more complicated. The standards are um, a lot more convoluted. And um, sometimes they're even industry specific, which doesn't make lots of sense. So let's get into uh, U.S. GAAP. And U.S. GAAP has a set of rules which will compare the IFRS and the cell phone. Let me put this right here. So you look at U.S. GAAP. The impairment standards for U.S. GAAP have one set of rules that we receive for they are amortized or depreciated, so it's not likely that they're overstating, and as a result, There's no annual test for impairment. When you look at indefinite life intangibles and goodwill, you're not amortized. They're more likely to be overstated. is an annual <coughs> So let's now think of the logic. You have assets that are depreciated, less likely to be overstated, so you don't have to test them annually. You do have to look at impairment indicators. Then, if you think about assets that we don't amortize, that we don't amortize, 
those are more likely to be overstated and they're going to be subject to an annual impairment test. So let's think about the logic. Does it make sense? If you're not writing an asset down, it's likely that it's overstated over time. So that's the logic. Now, it doesn't hold true 100%, but that's the basic idea that we use to justify the annual impairment testing. Now, we always, in all cases, look at impairment indicators. There's always impairment indicators looked at every year, whether you have an annual test or not. So we have to think about whether or not there is a de decrease in the market value of the long-lived asset. So has the asset lost any market value? Does the firm use the asset differently? So do they produce less with the asset than they did before? Is the asset you know, maybe not even being used? Has it been you know, sort of um, used? Or has the asset been put out of service? And then finally, the business client you know, has the asset value decline because the demand for the product that that asset produces is no longer in demand by the market. So with those impairment indicators, we would, in both cases, but now let's take a look at the finite life example, even though there's no annual test required, we are going to look at these impairment indicators to determine whether or not we should conduct an impairment test. When we look at the impairment test, although it's not required annually, we have to obviously look at those indicators. So you always look at the qualitative look at these impairment indicators in both cases, but let's now just take the finite life, the tangible to the plant assets. Let's say that the um, impairment indicators tell us that there is a need for an impairment test. The impairment test has two steps, and we'll take a look at them now. First step is something known, and this is where, unfortunately, a lot of attention has to be paid when you read, this is not IFRS, this is not the recoverable amount, but this is a recoverability test. A recoverability test is simply looking at the sum of the undiscounted cash flows and comparing it to the carrying value. Now this test was implemented to try to minimize the amount of write-offs that you have. And I'll explain why in a second. Because I asked mean, this question a couple of times, and the answer I have is, yeah, it doesn't make sense economically, because if you think about it, if you look at the carrying value of the asset, carrying value of the asset today, that's at time period zero, again, thinking about time value of money, and this is the end of the useful life of the asset, and let's say if I add these up, All the way out. Let's say the undiscounted cash flows turn out to be a that. They're not discounted. Today's carrying value might be 700. If the undiscounted cash flows exceed the carrying value, you stop. Now, let's think about why that doesn't make sense. First of all, these are projected cash flows that are forecasted by management. Secondly, they're not discounted, right? So this value is not valid. If you remember looking at chapter seven in the exam three that we took, if you look at this $30 a year from now, is it worth $30 today? No, it's worth less. If you look at this 35, 50, keep going out, you know, I've got obviously time period missing, but this $1,000 today is not worth a thousand dollars because you have to wait X number of years to get it. So the test is not valid, but it's something we have to deal with. So you would have to add up the undiscounted cash flows. If the undiscounted cash flows are greater than the carrying value, there's no impairment. You stop. If the undiscounted cash flows are less than carrying value, then the impairment is indicated. And that's known as the recoverability test.
if you pass that, then you go to the fair value. And the fair value tax should calculate the repair costs as a difference between carrying value and the fair value. The fair market. And we know from the earlier chapters, chapters one and two, where we get fair values from. We look at the hierarchy. The fair value hierarchy tells you you can get fair values from quoted market prices, market comparables, or discounted cash flows. Whatever's the most reliable. And the difference between carry value and the fair value would be your inherent cost. So once again, we go back and summarize by flowchart uh, that you have, it's also a textbook. So these are, this is, uh, this exhibit comes from the text. It is designed to help you understand U.S. gap impairment for finite life intangibles and property plant and equipment. They're both the same. They're not amortized and appreciated. You don't need an annual impairment test, but you do have to react if impairment indicators are present. If there are no impairment indicators, there's no further action. If there is an impairment indicator, you test for recoverability. If the carrying value is less than the undiscounted cash flows, then there's no impairment. If they are not, if they're greater, then you go to the fair value test. And if the carrying value is less than the fair value, then there's no loss. But if it's greater, you have to win it. I'm going to see the example in just a second. So that's the rule for finite life intangibles and plant and equipment. Now, before we go to the example, so we make sure this has been changed to understand that this will change if we don't advertise. If these are indefinite life assets, we're not going to wait until X number of years, we're going to test for this every year. We'll talk about also some of the exceptions that you've got. Just a note on this, make sure you're very clear that if the asset is held for disposal, it's what you would have done for a discontinued operation. You can write the asset up again, but not above its carrying value. It's not depreciated if it's held for sale. If it's held for use, the lower value, and I'll show you some numbers in a second, becomes the basis for depreciation, and there's no further adjustment in fair value unless the asset is written down. All right, so let's take an example. Well, let me see if you have any questions in the intro. No, that's the, the basic, basic rule. Finite life intangibles, plant assets would be subject to impairment based on impairment indicators. There's a recoverability test, which is based on undiscounted cash flows. If that's passed, if the carrying value exceeds the undiscounted cash flows, then you would have to go to a fair market value test to see if the fair value is less than the carrying value, and then you would write that down. If the asset's held for sale, you don't depreciate it, but you carry that equalizable value, you can write it up only to the original carrying value. You can't write it up above that, as we saw in discontinued operations. If it's held for sale, you continue to depreciate the new value, and no recovery is permitted. All right, so let's take an example. And <coughs> we have Frederick Willing of Wilson Company determines that one of its plant assets could be impaired. So you look at your impairment indicators, and you find out that the asset's net carrying value, so we put some of the numbers in here, case we, uh, we are going to try the recoverability. So the assets carrying value on the date of impairment is 905. So we know the carrying value here, 905,000. The cost of the asset on plant assets, let's put it here so you can see that. PPA cost is 1,560,000. 
and the accumulated appreciation is um, brought up to the date 655. Now, this is important being brought up to the date of the impairment because if the impairment test is done quarterly, if you don't depreciate on a quarterly basis, you're going to have to adjust it up to that point. Right, you won't have to worry about that. Exams, most questions that you see in the book assume that the asset has already been depreciated for the year, December 31st. Now, to measure the impairment loss, management gives us these future cash flows. The projected life of the asset is four years. That's the remaining life. So, we're now going to look at those cash flows and we know that it's 400, it's abbreviated here, 400 expected in the first year, 250 expected in the second, 140 in the third, and 60 in the fourth. The sum of the undiscounted cash flows is 850. Some of the undiscounted cash flows, 850. So now, looking at this problem, let's assume you're doing this problem, homework, exam, whatever it may be. You now say, all right, I've got undiscounted cash flows of 850. I've got a carrying value of 905. The impairment indicators, so going through this again, we look at the qualitative and the impairment indicators. It tells us we've got to start looking at cash flows. We have to start looking at fair values. The asset is now, it's the recoverability test. The recoverability test tells us that the future cash flows are less than the carrying value, therefore we have to test the what? Fair value. We have to go to the loss. If this number was greater than 905, you would stop. So whether or not you see this on a problem remains to be seen, but sometimes that will happen. What if you have a, you know, a question that this number might be 950 instead of 905? That's 950. If I just change one number in here, this becomes 950 and you stop. There's no impairment. Now, to get the impairment, we now have to look at the cash flows. So we run through the recoverability test. I could give you the fair value, or in this case, we're just showing you how to get it for, I'll tell you for the final, I'm going to give you the number. 739, 945. That's the fair value. Um, I couldn't get an appraisal. I did not have a market comparable, so I used discounted cash flows. The company's cost of capital was 8%. I discounted those cash flows back, and 739, 945 is the fair value. The carry value is 905. And in this case, I have an impairment loss <coughs> to be recorded at 165.055. Now, the way you record this, I debit the loss on the income statement. I can credit the plant asset directly. <laughs> or I can credit it cumulatively. So if we look up at the T account, either way it would work. So I'm going to credit accumulated in this case. So the new carrying value is going to be 7, uh, 39. 945. So now you have the asset written down to fair value.
losses on the income statement. I could have credited plant assets directly, but I credit the accumulated depreciation. In either case, the carrying value is 739.945 equal to fair value. Now, if that asset is held for use, depreciation is now changed. So now you have to decide on the useful life. So you would divide that by four. It's a straight line. You get a scrap value. Take the scrap value out. So that becomes the new basis for depreciation. If you're going to use the asset, if you're going to sell the asset, you don't depreciate it, and this would now become the baseline for net realizable value adjustments. If the market value falls again, you would write it down again. If the asset's value goes up, you could write it up but not above what number? 905. Okay. So 905 is the maximum that you can carry the asset. So if you look at carrying value of 905, then zero is the bottom, back to your store. The cost concept, this is 739, 945. You could get a recovery, but only up to Only up to original value. And that's if it's held for sale. Just like a discontinued operation, assets held for sale. So this is the US gap. If this question says part B, what do you do if it's an IFRS reporter? You'd have to work on different information. You'd have to get the recoverable amount. It's a little different process. Well, let's stay with the US gap for now. Questions on this illustration? So that's what you would need to do. You've got everything there. You've got the fair value. Given to you, in this case, I, I did the discounting, but it would be given to you. You've got cash flows, and you've got the count. <coughs> Any questions on that? What? Not move to the next. Indefinite life intangibles is good work. There will be different tests here, but what is a common factor is that they're not amortized, and therefore the FASB feels that they are more likely to be overstated and have to be tested for impairment annually. Now, the annual impairment test is possibly waived if there's this more likely than not threshold not met, which I'll show you. So let's take a look at indefinite life intangibles. So indefinite life intangibles uh, have no like to be identified in terms of contract, law, economics, whatever it may be. So they're expected to last for an indefinite period of time. So, you know, trade names, trademarks, um, licenses that are indefinitely renewed, of course, you capitalize them only when they're purchased, not subject to amortization, and unless there is a change where the definite like can be identified. Here's the issue. Indefinite life intangibles have to be tested annually, but there is also a more likely than not test that could be used. So what you could do is take a look at impairment indicators, and you could determine whether or not the impairment is actually permanent in nature. So for instance, you take a broadcast license, there is a blip in the market. So you've got a broadcast license that gets renewed every year. It's indefinite play. The market value of that collapses. Is it permanent? More likely than not, if it is, then you have to go through the impairment test. If it's more likely than not that the decline is not permanent, we don't have an impairment. So what this does, this exception is recent. This was put in to, again, minimize the amount of work that needs to be done for impairments. Doesn't mean that it's incorrect, 
but it means that it is, in fact, a way to be sure that the acid is impaired. So I gave the example of an indefinite flight. The tangible now is Bitcoin. Cryptocurrencies are considered indefinite flight intangibles. The market is all over the place. It's in a permanent decline. You know, if you have huge investment in, in Bitcoin and last couple of months it's been dropping, do you write those down? And then now all of a sudden then it shoots up again, do you write it up again? So the question is you have to think about the structure of the market and whether or not that market is going to continue to decline. And is that ever going to recover if it's permanent? That's why we have the more likely than not test. It's not to avoid the write off, and it's not to help management show higher earnings. The purpose is to avoid what? Volatility. If you look at the market for Bitcoin, your earnings could be all over the place. If you have a huge investment in that cryptocurrency, that could throw your statements all over the place. One year you can have losses, one year you can have huge profits back and forth. So this really avoids having too much volatility in those fair values that you're using. So the more likely than not test, even for the broadcast losses, could be anything that you've got, you try to avoid excessive volatility in valuation. So the more likely than not test is conducted with a look at qualitative factors or impairment indicators. And as we said, uh, that is going to be done in order to avoid volatility. Now, what's more likely than not? More likely than not is slightly more than a 50% chance. You're going to see more likely than not probably um, six, eight, ten times throughout the accounting curriculum. It's used in multiple standards. And it's also used in IFRS as well. But it's used in multiple standards in US GAAP. Same thing's going to be true for goodwill. You'll have a more likely than not test. Now, when you have an indefinite life intangible, this is an important point. I mean, of course, you can memorize all this, but you want to be able to explain this to somebody. There's no recoverability test for an indefinite life intangible. You go right to the fair value test. Why? If an indefinite life intangible has an indefinite life, cash flows will be what? Indefinite. Could you ever fail a recoverability test? No, because you're going to be going out to infinity pretty much with these cash flows. So you would never fail a recoverability test. So there is no recoverability test when you look at an indefinite life of tangible. You only have a fair value test, and it's a one step, and it's based on carrying value versus fair value. Right? So you will not have any issues regarding recoverability. So here's the way the test would look. You look at the qualitative factors, you do the more likely than not test. Does it indicate that the asset's impaired? Is it more than a 50% chance that the asset's impaired? If the answer is no, you're done. If it's yes, then you have to look at the asset's carrying value. And this is a fair value test. If the asset's carrying value is less than its fair value, there's no write-off. If it's greater, as we had in this case, then it would be a write So uh, in, our, in our other example, if that, light, if that asset was an indefinite life intangible, you would have the same loss, but you would just avoid that recoverability test. Right. And the same thing's going to be true for goodwill. Goodwill is going to have the same basic concept where we're going to go through a more likely than not test first to determine whether or not there is impairment. After the more likely than not test is conducted, if there is evidence that the group will is impaired, you have a pretty simple test now. It's a new, it may not be in this, this version of the textbook, but this is what's going to be gap beginning in January. So you're going to need to know for the CPA exam. And this is what I would want you to know. Uh, you're going to look at the carrying value of the reporting unit versus its fair value. Now, this is a problem with goodwill because if we look at this example, 
What is the fair value of the reporting unit? First of all, what's a reporting unit? All right, so let's say that uh, Walgreens um, buys Dwayne Reed for whatever reason, or Walgreens now is partnering with United Healthcare. You know, why do they buy them? They paid a premium for them, they paid goodwill. Is it their, is it just to get the company itself? Is it their billing system? Is it their marketing uh, expertise? What are you paying for? So within the company, now if you get a retail company, let's say you buy a retail business. Do you buy that business because of its brick and mortar stores? Are you buying that business because of its credit department? They have an excellent credit granting department. Uh, are you buying it because of their website? their e-business, uh, whatever it may be, that's the unit in the company where the goodwill resides. So you have to look at the value of the reporting unit. It may not be a subsidiary. Let's go back to my first example. If Walgreens buys Dwayne Reed just for the entire entity, then the reporting unit is Dwayne Reed. But if there's something specific in that company, that becomes the reporting unit. Now, here's the problem. What if your subsidiary is the reporting unit. How do you value the how do you value a subsidiary? There are courses on valuation. Investment bankers do this all the time. You got to value another company. How do you value it? If the company's not, if you own all the stock right now and it's not publicly traded, how do you value it? You got to do the same thing that we said before. You look at market comparables. You look at recent transactions. So. Was another pharmacy purchased, or look at um, let's say United Healthcare with, with Walgreens. You know all these pharmacies and other companies are partnering with healthcare providers. Was there a recent merger? So if another pharmacy wants to buy another healthcare provider, they may look at the Walgreens, you know, um, United Healthcare as a precedent transaction to see what the company might be worth. So. It's extremely expensive to value the reporting unit. That's why we've got the more likely than not to. You're trying to minimize the cost. This is a cost benefit issue. Don't forget, if you want to test the goodwill impairment every year, you would have to pay for somebody to value a subsidiary every year. And that's pretty expensive. I mean, just think about getting someone to appraise your house. That could be a big chunk of money for you, too, right? Just think about getting someone to appraise another business. But if you do it, and maybe it's a discounted cash flow model, maybe it's a precedent transaction, whatever it is, it's the same um, approach that you use to value a company when you buy it. They're exactly the same. Then we look at the book value. So this is what the company looks like. It's got good wool on its books for 300, and it's got net assets, assets minus liabilities, other than good wool for five. So the book value of reporting unit is eight, and therefore, we take the impairment loss to be 100. Now, goodwill is not amortized. So when you look at the goodwill, it is at 300. We're now gonna write it down by 100, and that's the loss. It's the difference between the fair value and the book value. So you would get the impairment loss and credit the goodwill. And goodwill would be on the books now at 200. Another important point is that you can't write good, goodwill down below zero. I mean, the most you can do is write this off by 300. Now, if you go into the textbook, you're going to find out that the um, older rules are a lot more complicated. This is a, this is a big simplification um, for U.S. debt. Now, I want to go over one more thing with you, and just want to go back to this to make sure you're aware that if you think about private companies, private companies can amortize goodwill over a 10-year period. 
They have the same test, except that the annual requirement is not in place. The annual requirement is not in place. simply fair value versus recoverable amount. And that's for all assets. So I'm just going to review this here. So for IFRS, <coughs> there's only one type of test. This is for all, all assets. This would be for tangible fixed assets. Finite life intangibles. And then you've got the And in all three cases, you're going to look at the recoverable amount. Of course, there's always impairment indicators. <coughs> versus carrying down. And that's true in all. We don't differentiate between the assets. Recoverable amount, we know, is the greater of, and I'll put it up on the screen. And these are your impairment indicators, external, internal, very much like US GAAP, and the evidence of obsolescence. And the impairment loss is the difference between the carrying value and the recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is the greater of. The asset in use, or the asset in exchange. And we, know, we know we did this last week. So the asset in exchange is NRV, which is the selling price minus disposal cost. And the value in use is a fair value, usually a discounted cash flow. And there's been a recent change. I know the book does not have this uh, in all places, but in all three cases, the recovery of the loss is permitted up to the original carrying down. So just compare the two on each, each board. You can see that IFRS is a lot easier. 
By the way, U.S. GAAP does not permit, it's an important point, but I'm going to make sure I get in here. Uh, we do not permit recovery except for assets held for disposal. So no recovery except for <coughs> asset held for disposal. Same test, you have to look at what is known as a cash generating unit, get the recoverable amount of that cash generating unit, compare it to its carrying value. If there is a loss, that would come from the fact that the cash generating unit is valued higher than its recoverable amount. And that would be your loss. So IFRS is very consistent no matter what the asset is. Recoverable amount against carrying value, that's the loss. The only difference is that Goodwill is the only asset that cannot have a recovery. So you can tie this together pretty neatly 
are just understanding that all of the intangibles and tangible plant assets for IFRS will operate exactly the same way. And that is the recoverable amount against the carrying value. That's the write down. You can recover that loss if it's a tangible plant asset, a finite life intangible or an indefinite life, but you would not recover for good book. The only difference is that, and again, this is not for you to deal with right now, something you'll see in practice. What's the reporting unit on the US GAAP? What's the cash generating unit under IFRS? And depending on those definitions, which we're not going to get into here, you could get a slight difference. Now, another point that you'll see when you take advanced accounting, which is mergers and acquisitions, you'll find out that um, when you look at the goodwill testing, and when you look at the impairments for goodwill, they'll probably bring in the fact that the first thing you might look at are other assets. So when you go into that reporting unit, or if you go into the um, cash generating unit, and the impairment indicators tell you that this uh, subsidiary may have lost value. Is it really the goodwill that lost value, or is it plant assets, or is it something else? Is it a franchise, is it another part of the company that lost value? And you would write those down first. So if you found that plant assets were impaired, if you found out that um, finite life and tangibles were impaired, you'd write those down first. So it's a much more complicated process than just going in and saying, well, you know what, I think the goodwill is impaired. You'd look at everything in that unit and see um, if any of the other assets were uh, impaired in the and then finally, you've got your flow chart, and we look at the impairment indicators. If there are impairment indicators, that's the uh, more likely than not test. If we don't think there's an impairment, we stop there. If we do, we look at the cash generating units recoverable amount, and compare that to the carrying value. If the carrying value is less, there's no loss, carrying value exceeds the recoverable amount if there is an impairment cost. All right, so that is it for testing. I gave you all the solutions, all the questions in the back of those modules. Uh, we also have the other examples to look at on the videos. Before we move ahead to something that's unique to IFRS, any questions on comparing the impairment testing? Uh, so you have to know both US GAAP and IFRS. Next, go to the next module and find out that this is a um, a unique accounting practice for IFRS, and this is a revaluation model. So that when you look at international accounting standards. You are permitted to carry your intangibles or plant assets either at cost or revaluation. On the revaluation model, you carry the asset at fair value. So this is unique to IFRS. You are permitted to value the intangibles, plant assets, at fair value. And this approach excludes goodwill. It's going to make sure you know that the revaluation model does not apply to goodwill. So the revaluation model will include property, plant, equipment, land, buildings, finite life intangibles, patents, indefinite life intangibles, copyrights, trademarks, trade names, all subject to the revaluation model. That is carry that cost or revaluation. This is one of the things that you'll find. We're starting to do this in US GAAP too. 
uh, with fair value options in some ways. It gets kind of uh, difficult if you start to look at the statements because they, they, it's very difficult to compare them. So what if you're looking at a British company, you're looking at British Petroleum versus another um, you know, uh, UK oil and gas company. One decides to use revaluation, the other one doesn't. The assets are on different bases. So you're going to have to sort that out somehow by looking at the footnotes. What the revaluation model is for a minute. Now, once you have the revaluation model, the question is, um, how do you handle the revaluation? So I've shown you a couple of ways to do this. Yeah, you, you could flow it through the plant asset account. You could flow it through the, um, the um, uh, accumulated depreciation or amortization account. But we have some specific approaches. And those two approaches are, this is to apply the revaluation. And on the revaluation, remember, the revaluation model, we just make sure you know that when we look at this fair value model, let's say you got a carrying value down to zero, the revaluation model could go below carrying value or above. So there's no upper boundary when you use revalue. This is a, a, a true, this is a true fair value model. It's an appraisal model. And the problem is if you elect to use revaluation, you have to commit to look at these revaluations on a very frequent basis. So if your company elects under IFRS to use the revaluation model, you have to commit to make those adjustments or at least to look at the fair values on an annual or frequent basis. But just remember, when we say fair value, this is a real or a true fair value approach. It is not limited. So you can write the asset up to its current market price. You're not bound by the original carrying value. And we've got upward, and they call them upward and downward revaluations. I'm going to show you some of the accounting right now. Now, the two methods that you can use in a revaluation model is proportional method. And this is handling the accumulated depreciation or amortization and depreciation elimination method. So two ways to handle the adjustment. You can either adjust the cost of the asset and accumulate it proportionately. We'll show you how that's done. Or you can just eliminate the depreciation, make the depreciation zero. The proportional method uses a factor to adjust fair value divided by carrying value. So when we look at this proportion or under the proportional method, the adjustment factor is the ratio of the fair value, this is sort of proportional now, fair value divided by carrying value. And that factor is what you use as a multiple So that's the proportional adjustment that you make. Now, the best way to do this, as always, is to go through an example. All right, so let's take the illustration on the top of page two. And we are told that an entity buys a machine for $30,000 on January 1st of X4. The machine is for life is 10 years with a zero residual value. 
Then you revalue the amount of the machine. That's the fair value, it's 36,000. And we depreciated it for one year, 3,000. So the carrying value is 27. So put this together. Property plan and equipment, that's going to be 30,000. The accumulated depreciation is three. And we took one year on this, we straight lined it, 10 years, 3,000. And we held the asset for one year. So the net book value right now is 27. Now, we go out in the market and we have an appraise and we find out the fair value The appraisal value is 36. So that's what I was saying before. We're going to wipe this up. If the carrying value is 27, we're wiping this up above the carrying value. There's a $9,000 upward revaluation. So it's nine thousand dollars. So we're gonna have to wipe this up. So I'm realized gain of nine thousand. That's an upward revaluation. Now, the question is, how do you handle it? You know, you can do one or two things, and the easiest one, I guess, is to get rid of the depreciation and add 6,000 to the plant asset, right? That's the depreciation elimination method or the proportional method where you take an adjustment and proportionally adjust the two. So I'm gonna do the proportional first, because that's a bit more, um, a bit more involved. Well, does everyone understand the issue? You are now permitted to carry your plant and your tangible assets, except for goodwill, at fair value. You can get appraisals, you can use discounted cash flow, you can use quoted market <coughs> price, whatever it is. If it's land, you can bring in an appraiser for that, whatever it may be. I mean, you can find lots of different ways to appraise assets. You get professional appraisers to do that, or valuers, or whatever you call them, and they would take care of that. So everyone understand the issue. You're not going to write this asset up above its original cost, above its carrying value right now. So how do we do it? Well, the problem is, again, if, if you use depreciation elimination, you can actually see it. I mean, I'll, you know, I'm going to show you the formalities in a second. But I think you can see it here. If you eliminate the depreciation, that goes to zero. And now you're sitting there in 30. Just write up the asset by six. And now the asset's sitting there at 36, and there's no depreciation. Right? That's, that, and by the way, that debit of six plus the debit of nine is going to balance the credit, the gain of, of nine. So this will flow nicely, and I'll show you that in a sec. What gets a little bit more complicated is the portion. Portional method would say we want you to come up with a way to value the asset at 36, but we want the plant asset adjusted and we want the accumulated adjusted. We're trying to capture what the asset would look like had it always been on your books at fair value. So the fair value adjustment factor, 36 over the 27. 1.33. And you might have to bring that out to lots of decimal places to get it even, but here's what would happen. 
I'm going to look at my cost at December 31st. You can see I got this from a uh, IFRS, so it's day before month. But December 31st, before the adjustment, it was 30. After the adjustment, I want the asset to be 40. So I'm going to write it up by 10. So what will happen, I'm just going to show you this now before we even do the entry. So I know we're going to bring this up to 10. So I want this to 40. On the accumulated, I'm sitting there with 3. The adjusted factor 1.3333 brings that to 4. So the adjustment is a thousand. And actually, all you need is the first one. Once you know what the asset's supposed to be, you can plug the accumulated to get the 36. Now, as I said, you probably need to go out multiple decimal points to get round numbers. And I'll, I'll point that out to you on the final if I don't want you to go out there all the time. But, that's the proportional approach. Now, here's the journal entry. And maybe before we do the entry, let me make sure everyone sees this. Anyone have any questions on this? Are we more clear as to what you need to do? You have to proportionately adjust the asset and the accumulated so that you would get to what the asset would have looked like had you always valued it at fair value. And to prove that, I've got this later on in the module, but to prove that to you, right now the asset is 36,000, right? There's no scrap. How many years are left? Nine. So you're going to depreciate now at 4,000 per year. That's as if the asset always existed on your books at what? At 40. Now, the reason why I like this approach, and I'm, I'm a pretty big fan and proponent of IFRS is for a couple of reasons. One, it's more relevant, right? The fair values are more relevant to the reader of the financial statements. Now, reliability, well, I mean, if you get a certified appraiser, not all that terrible. Not only that, you're adjusting your net income now, and that income is now brought up. Remember we said this when we talked about, I'm talking about this very co first couple of weeks of class. I was saying that by using fair value, you now adjust the depreciation to better associate with inflation, right? So now, as you're selling product, you're selling at higher selling prices. The depreciation now is more associated or better matched with those higher sales dollars. So the fair value approach is much more relevant than historical cost. And on top of that, Based on the IFRS model, notice that you debit the asset for 10, you credit accumulated for one, and then you credit stockholders equity. Gains do not go into income. That's another thing I happen to favor. You don't want these gains going losses as well for conservatism, but gains don't. The gains go into stockholders' equity. It's almost like AOCI or other comprehensive income. It is revaluation surplus. In, in, um, in IFRS, especially in Great Britain, you'll see a lot of surplus accounts sitting in stockholders' <coughs> equity. So revaluation surplus now is 9,000. And that's going to be the gain. So the, the nice thing about this, assets are at fair value. Depreciation is properly stated. It, it, matches better with inflated sales dollars and revenues, and the gain does not distort net income. Does not distort net income. Now, the same thing is going to be true for the depreciation elimination model, which I already showed you. But that's pretty, I think, pretty straightforward, where you know you have to get the asset to um, 36, you're going to write it up by 3. I'm just showing you the gain 
how much did I gain and allocate it and leave this, that goes up by six, and you know you have to reduce the depreciation by three. So the adjustment here, six, and that goes to zero. So now the assets ultimate 36. They also will be depreciated over a nine year period. You also need to get 4,000. Journal entry, gotta make a different entry in this case. It's not the same, but the gain is the same. So debit plant and equipment for six. I mean debit and silver. They accumulated for three and you credit the revaluation surplus or the equity. All right, so that is the revaluation model. We're going to do a little bit more of that. Under IFRS. This is not permitted under US GAAP. US GAAP only allows you to use the cost model. Cost model. Now, a couple things to note on this before we conclude, and that is that, again, the depreciation would be the same. Um, just to remind you that once you commit to using the fair value approach, you have to continually and frequently revalue or at least appraise the asset to make sure that the evaluations are up to date. So if you make that commitment, the revaluations have to be up to 